uh, last week I felt like God, the message was more of a mandate from the Lord than, than just a message. And so if you weren't able to be here, you go back and that'll be posted online this week and listen to the message. And so I'm not repeating it. I'm going to emphasize some different things here. But uh, our worship this morning was kind of focused toward the same thing. And, um, and that is when... David became king and united the nations of Israel and Judah and all of the tribes. Uh, the first thing that he did was to, uh, his, he had such a heart for the presence of God that he knew that was the missing ingredient. And so he said, we have to go get the ark. We have to bring the ark of God, which represented God's very presence. And uh, I think, Brian, do you have that picture up there? Okay, this was the Ark of the Covenant. We'll talk a little bit about that. And God gave the instructions to Moses in the book of Exodus, uh, particularly chapter 25, on how to build this. And uh, the, this is the only piece of furniture that God gave instruction for in Moses' tabernacle that had multiple uses. It was the only piece of furniture that was in two parts, where one part supported the other part. It was the only piece of furniture in the, the tabernacle that was made out of two different things. And so it's actually two pieces of furniture. The other thing is it's the only piece of furniture that was a chair or a seat. All of the other articles in that temple, uh, the, the priests had to stand to minister uh, before the Lord. They had to stand to wash in the basin. They had to stand to offer the incense. They had to stand at the table of showbread. Uh, they had to stand before uh, the candlestick. They had to stand to do all these other forms of ministry at the altar. Only this one uh, was the, the bottom half of that was a box that was made of wood that was overlaid with gold. And anytime we see that in the Scripture, it represents humanity, the wood, the temporal things, being covered by gold or the purity or the eternal things. And so it's God totally covering man. It's the eternal totally encompassing the temporal. And so the bottom half of that box represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, what was to be placed inside of that box was a copy of the law. And symbolizing the fact that the law was in Christ or that he fulfilled the law. That he didn't do away with it. He totally fulfilled it and so would consume it. That, that he became uh, the law. And the top half of that box was made out of one piece of solid gold that was hammered. One piece of solid gold it wasn't uh, the the angels there the cherubim represented uh, w weren't made and then attached to the lid it, it was all one symbolizing that it was complete and it was made out of one piece of gold and it wasn't melted it was hammered uh, symbolizing uh, the the testimony of Christ that uh, where he became this place and the top half of that box is called the mercy seat the mercy seat. And the, that represents Christ's ministry of mercy. But it was sustained by the bottom half of that box or supported by it, which was sustained by Christ's person. Who He was and what He did. And, and they, they're interchangeable that we see who He really was by what He did in offering mercy and taking upon Himself uh, the, the beating that we deserved, if you will, but still it was in purity, it was in perfection that he completed that. And so God gave these specific instructions to Moses and he said he would come down in between the wings of these cherubim or in between these two uh, uh, angels on this box and that he would speak with Moses, he would meet with him there and that he would communicate with him. Now, now the only exception is the only other people who could go inside of that were priests and the high priests and only once a year and only with blood. And so the priests would come before this box and they would have in the one hand uh, a bowl of 
uh, bread and oil, and in the other hand, a bowl of blood to be offered. And, and obviously, God knows our hearts because here we're priests coming before the holiness of the presence of God. And how many of you guys get a little awkward in, in church and don't know what to do with your hands? That one didn't mean that as a joke. I meant that seriously. Every wedding uh, ceremony that I officiate, we have to give the guys specific instructions on what to do with their hands. Because guys are awkward in moments like that of what we do with our hands. And I think guys are sometimes awkward when we come before the presence of the Lord, which is exactly what this represented, and His holiness and His purity what, what do we do with our hands? And so he gives us two things. The illustration here uh, on this is of the wings of the cherubim. Uh, some other illustrations of this uh, are the cherubim that Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6. And they had six wings. And it says, with two of the wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they flew representing prayer, humility, and worship. And so when we, when we see that, that, that we come, that God has a plan and He gives instructions to the priests, in other words, don't come empty-handed. That, that, that you're not to be here fidgeting with your robes and you know, trying to find a comfortable place with your hands. You're to, you're to be holding something. And you're to be holding something that you can come and present in worship. And so we see that, I want you to get this picture, because uh, the other thing I want you to notice is the poles that were attached here to the ark, and only the priests were to carry this ark, and they were to carry it upon their shoulders. And Exodus chapter 25 said, the poles are never to be removed from the ark. Exodus chapter 25, build these poles, by the way, these poles were wood as well, totally overlaid with gold. And they were to, to, to be grasped by the priests and be carried upon their shoulders. All right? Now, the, the significance of that is that last week we talked about uh, 2 Samuel 6, and today we're going to look at the same uh, passage just for a moment in 1 Chronicles chapter 13. You can turn there with me, 1 Chronicles 13. And, and here's David's account of looking back and realizing that, that God prescribed the, the uniqueness. By the way, the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of God, as it's called, was the only piece of furniture that was ever to be removed from the tabernacle. And God gave them instruction that they could remove it from the tabernacle and take it with them into battle, representing going into battle with God's presence. How, how many of you realize the, the significance and the connection there? In fact, let me just ask, how many of you have ever been into battle without the presence of the Lord going before you? And, and how many of you know those results? How, how'd that work for you? Okay. And, and so here, whenever they took the ark into battle with them, as God had prescribed and as God had commanded, they never lost and they routed their enemies. And yet, here was this ark that represented the presence of God. And uh, 1 Samuel 4 tells us that as they went up against the Amalekites, that they defeated them and they took the ark. But, but what was life and victory for the children of God as they possessed God's presence became death and destruction for those who didn't know how to handle it. And they're, they're, it, it, it created all of these uh, tumors and these hideous diseases in their bodies, and finally they said, let's get this thing out of here and, and, and take it back to the Israelites. And they said, well, we're, we're not just going to take it back and say, here, we don't want this. Uh, we, we better take an offering. And so send a guilt offering. And they said, what should we send? And they said, now this is the best they can come up with. How many of you know it's funny when, the, when people who don't understand God and His ways try to, try to appease those who do? And so here were these people they had tumors in really awkward places, and, and so then rats infested the land. So they said, here's what we'll do. We'll send back six gold tumors and six gold rats. Now, how do you think, brother, what an offering. Hallelujah. I, I hope that nobody just felt like you wanted to make a sacrifice to the Lord and 
brought your tumor and put it in the offering plate this morning, okay, as your guilt offering or whatever. But, but in Christ, all of those things represented. And so we saw last week how as they began to bring this ark back um, uh, into the people with rejoicing, that, that they set it on a new cart. And, and as they were coming back in to the city and to the place David had prepared for it, that uh, the, when they got to the threshing floor, which is a place of separation, a threshing floor is where you separate the wheat from the chaff. And there are times in our life that God separates us from things that have attached to us. And at the threshing floor is the place many times where God will ask us to make a sacrifice. And so when we don't do it God's way, sometimes we don't get God's results. And so they, instead of the Levites carrying this, by the way, the poles were never to be removed. Let me remind you of that. And so it, either they were they had been removed by God's enemies or they were there and they didn't know what to do with them. And the significance is, I believe, that God made a way for us always to have a handle on His presence. Not by way of control, but by way of access. I hope you're hearing me this morning. That, that God never meant for you not to be able to touch His presence. But the way in which we touch His presence and the way we go about handling His presence needs to be in the way that He prescribed. And I believe this is a prophetic word speaking of the church and so many in the church today who have settled for procedures and programs at the expense of the presence of God. That, that we've built carts and convenience to, to get the presence of God to people and people to the presence of God. And many times it's backfired and it's been death because somebody in their enthusiasm has sought to, to, to reach out and help God out a little bit in their life. Or because, you know, he was kind of floundering and when the oxen stumbled and the, ark, uh, the, the cart slipped, the, the ark tipped, and Uzzah reached up to, to stabilize it. It wasn't a wicked thing at all, but the presence of God broke out against him and he died there. And David was smitten in his heart, the word says. And, and he cried out to God and his cry was in the form of a question that is incredibly telling about David's attitude in his heart. And he said, how can the ark of God ever come to me? L l let that sink in. How can the ark of God ever come to me? I want you to see that this was after a mistake. But it wasn't an intentional thing. His heart was good. His purpose was good. His plan was good. It was God. God blessed it. A and so he went with rejoicing. And in the midst of his rejoicing, bam! Bam! Death breaks out. You ever tried to do something for the right reason at the right time? You just did it in the wrong way? And, and what was victory in your heart now is a stinging defeat? And have you ever really had to be honest with yourself like David who won such great victories? But I hate to lose. And it's not just that I'm a bad loser. I hate to lose spiritual battles because it comes back to things that I've e either overlooked or, or that it brings questions and concerns where I misunderstand God and if I get stuck there, I stay there. And Israel had for years, generations, that when God gave the instructions for the original tabernacle to Moses, he gave Moses special permission that you don't have to meet all the qualifications for the high priest. Whenever my presence enters here and I want to meet with you, I will summon you. And you don't have to go through all of these procedures like the priests do uh, of being stripped in the outer court and being washed and, and having to wear appropriate clothing and do all the things. You can just come straight into my presence. 
And it was always God's heart for us to be able to come to His presence because He wanted to be in ours. But the one thing that separated us from Him was His holiness. And that's what we still don't understand. And that there were thousands upon thousands in the community of Israel who were content to live under God's covering and never enter His presence. And I would submit to you that we're just repeating the pattern in our day. That's why it is so significant as we're looking at, at what God's idea and picture of the church is. That, that we find its heart in Acts chapter 15 where James stands in this meeting and they're deciding what is the church going to be and what form is it going to take. And James reaches back to Amos' prophecy in Amos chapter 9. And he recalls the fact that the prophet said, in the last days, God said, I will return and I will rebuild David's fallen tent or tabernacle or the place that he prepared for this ark. And I will restore it. What is the it that was restored? What was restored in David's day was not just a form of worship, but life-giving worship. That nothing that David established in that temer, temporary tent, that tabernacle that housed the, the ark of, of God, was guilt-producing. It was all life-giving. It was to be done with rejoicing, not heaviness. It was not a commandment. It was an invitation. And that God wants to turn our hearts from this guilt-producing sin management in our lives to this place where we are sons who minister before His presence. And that we come before it with confidence, but, but not just flippantly. That, that we come before with this sense of, I just want to be in the presence of God. And for David, that was his driving passion. And so it begins in his heart with a good attempt gone bad. How many of you began your Christian walk in that way? A good attempt gone bad. Or a good attempt intercepted by people who told you, no, you have to do this, and 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 you have to wear this, you have to talk like this. you got to make these changes. That's about as smart as a fisherman cleaning his fish before he catches them. And Jesus used the illustration. I will make you fishermen. Actually, I will make you fishermen, fishers of men. So he was t talking to people who already knew how to fish. Now, if there's one thing fishermen don't like, it's for somebody else telling them how to fish. And Jesus said, we're going after a new target, and, and, and so we're going to need a new bait, and, and we're going to need a new method. And, and, and instead of fishing for fish, you're going to fish for men. And then he proved to them that he knew how to catch fish better than they did when he said, have you tried the other side of the boat? That, that's like fisherman trash talk right there. That's like, What? Other side of the boat. It, it's this is our honey hole. You no, know, you're you're off by about six feet. Just just walk across the boat. And sometimes the thing God has for us in, in productivity and the abundance and what He has for our life is just on the other side of the boat. But if we're not careful, we get so used to fishing from this side that we forget there's another side. That, that if we're not careful, we get so caught up in the forms or the formulas or the procedures or the process or the programs that we forget it's all about the presence. And what God promised was not to restore a formula or a program or a process. What God said was, when you get connected with my presence... And it's why Jesus went to the cross to become the sacrifice, to, to fulfill the bottom part of that ark, 
to, to, to be the one who fulfilled the law for us and who became the sacrifice and who, who opens the door and the way, a new and living way for us. But he also fulfills the top part in the purity and the perfection that it was in the presence of God dwelling and communicating with God's people. I will teach you and I will instruct you in the way that you should go. And then he makes a way that we all have access that is no longer separate. That's what James was referring to when he said that, that God was going to establish this so that all mankind together could seek him. That the Gentiles who were called by his name would now be included with the Jews who were his chosen people. And, and that God from every people, nation, tribe, and tongue would bring together a life-giving worship force that would pray and petition and stand before God and minister before God on the instruments and minister before God with singing. That, that those men, many of them that God uh, uh, placed and chose to be uh, uh, the ones who ministered before the Lord were some of David's mightiest warriors. They were listed in the mighty men. I think it's intriguing that Benaiah, one of those that we talked about last week, who killed a lion and killed a giant. and I mean, this guy w w was a fighting machine. It said, and of the second rank. Of the second rank. How would you like to have a guy who killed a lion with his bare hands on your B team? On the JV squad? What does that tell you about the first stringers? Come on now. And I know with God there are no second class people. With God there are no little people. With God there are no little places. God knows where we fit. But at the same time, I'm telling you, when we see the significance of that and the victories that he won and what he was willing to do, the, the, the valor that all of these men ministered with, and then when I look in the church and I'm saying, where are the mighty men? Where are those who know how to handle their heart issues and know how to handle loyalty? who know how to handle rejection, who know how to respond to authority, where are they? And I would submit to you that many of them are missing in action. Because they stood the test on the battlefield, but when they came to times like this, knowing how to handle God's presence, they missed it. Just like David. But they never got over the defeat. They never got over the pain. They just removed themselves from the process. And so they joined the ranks of the miserable ones on the outside. And they, they, they traded in the access to, the, to God's very presence in their life just to know that the big guys got us covered. And that the church becomes a place where, where we look to but seldom go to. And just like those who would never even enter the outer court and they would see that, oh, their sacrifice is being offered for me. I don't have to offer them. They're, they're never the ones to enter in to offer the sacrifice of praise that God really desires in our heart or to do so with a pure heart or in those defeats, go back and inquire of the very God who's disappointed you. Yes, I said it that way. Because it's what David said. His question says a lot more than what it asks. Here he is with a dead man on his hands in the midst of a celebration, and he asks a question, God, why isn't this working? This isn't what I planned. This is really disappointing to me. I hate to lose. So why this? Why now? I wanted to do this for you. How many of you have had those questions in your life? Better yet, how many of you are not just sitting here with a question, you're here with a question sitting on you? Heavy on your heart. Weighing on your mind. You feel distance, disconnect. When what you really want is God's presence. This morning I want us to look again at this passage, at this picture in uh, 1 Chronicles 15, where David gives us basically the answer to his own question. And he gives it to us by illustration. He gives it to us in, in picture in the Chronicle. In, in chapter 13, uh, the parallel to 2 Samuel chapter 6, 
is where they attempted to bring back the ark the first time. When they got to the threshing floor, stumbled, us is dead, God breaks out against them, and David's heart was smitten, and he said, God, how can your presence ever come to me? How can I be fulfilled? How can I experience what my heart really desires? How can I get past the disappointment of an event to have the pleasure of an experience with a holy God? How can I and my mistakes fellowship with you in your perfection and he gives us the answer six things let me share them with you the first is consecration in first chronicles chapter uh, 15 is the account then of them bringing the ark back they set it aside at the house of obed-edom and god blessed everything he did uh, everything he had in such an incredible way that somebody reminded David of that and it was like, okay, I- I'm going to go and pursue it again. And, and I just believe that's prophetic of someone here this morning, maybe many of you that have been disappointed. Uh, maybe you've been defeated. Maybe you've been greatly discouraged. Maybe there's just been a season where you thought, I lost that battle. And so you've been hesitant to go back. And God wants you in His presence. And He wants you to be one of those that participate in in not only bringing His presence back, but doing it for others. And so here, He gives us the account again. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 1. After David had constructed buildings for himself in the city of David, which is Jerusalem, Uh, still to this day is known as the city of David. He prepared a place. Everybody say a place. He prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Several weeks ago, we taught a series of messages, and to me that just embodies it right there. The fact that you can't make God move, but you can prepare a place for God to move. David wasn't making God move and David wasn't moving God's presence. David was preparing a place for God to move. And God honored it because David did it right. Uh, The second time he went back and inquired of the Lord. Verse 3, David assembled all of Israel in Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to the place he had prepared for it. Then he called together and it lists all all of the, the tribes. I just think it's very interesting that It starts with, from the descendants of Kohath, Uriel the leader, and how many? 120. That that when God wanted to give David the answer and and fulfill his heart request, he began with 120. 120. Does that ring a bell to anybody? And on the day of Pentecost, how many people were in the upper room? There you go. God, God has a plan And God has a pattern to reveal His presence to those who seek Him. Even everything about the tabernacle of Moses pointed to Jesus. The entire thing was built in the shape of a cross. Every expression of that inside of worship, from the sacrifice in the outer court to to the uh, presence of God that dwelt in the holiest of holies, it, it pointed to Jesus. It pointed to the presence of God. pointed to what God had already done for us. But unless we see it, then we respond to it from a distance and we don't understand. Much like David's wife did when she saw his rejoicing and couldn't understand his extreme reaction and his joy at, at something that to her was inanimate. Why is he getting so excited about a box? Some of you wives say that same thing of watching 22 men chase a pigskin around on a football field. Or why is he so passionate about a golf game? Or why is he so passionate about whatever? And many times it's because 
they've become substitutes for the presence of God. They become replacements for what God wants in our life to truly and genuinely fulfill us, complete us, make us the men and women, sons and daughters that He's called us to be. And if we don't see the, the process and how that it's done in His presence, that we can't do it on our own, that then it either ends up killing us like it did Uzzah, or we end up living lives of disappointment and discouragement like David would have if he'd have stopped right there. So, so the first thing is that when they begin to bring it back, I want you to see what the Scripture says here. Verse 11, David summoned Zadok uh, and Abiathar the priests and Uriel and uh, Asaiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, Aminadab, the Levites. So he's got the priests and the Levites. Verse 12, he said to them, you are the heads of the Levitical families. You and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourselves. Everybody say consecrate. Consecrate simply means uh, to, to set yourself apart to God. You're, you're to consecrate yourselves. And then he goes on to tell them the reason why. The first is to bring up the ark of the Lord uh, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. That's the third time David said that. It was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. Now watch this. We did not inquire of Him about how to do it in the prescribed way. In other words, we didn't ask God how to bring His presence to us. We just wanted to go get it. And what, what we anticipated and what we expected to bring life brought death, and so now we're disappointed. Did, did any of you ever attempt to live a life to, for God or give your life to God and then you make mistakes and realize that the old man that you thought that you had killed resurrected himself along with old habits and desires or, or that you, were, you had a new spirit uh, with an old heart or, or that you had a new spirit with an old mindset and some of the very things that God had sacrificed for and died for to separate you from and consecrate you to himself had come back into your life and you'd become a part of that. Now you got a whole nother battle. Now you're not just facing the battle that has defeated you. You're facing the disappointment and doubt that do I have what it takes? Are you hearing me this morning? Maybe I should skip ahead. Let me skip ahead to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And, and here David writes a song of thanksgiving when, when they finally complete the process and God's presence is there. Let, let me just read the last verse. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 39 says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. The song was over. Then all the people said, Amen. And all the people said, Praise the Lord. That's your permission. After they finished the song, all the people said, and, and then all the people said, and you can, you can reverse them if you want to. You can say praise the Lord first and then amen. So, so you have permission to say amen and you have permission to say praise the Lord. Or you have permission to say ouch. Or you have permission to say that's me. Or you have permission to say my God, my God. You have permission to say Abba, Father. You have permission to say help me, Lord. You have permission to say I honor you. I worship you. Father, I really do want you and your presence. Okay, back to the story. You still have permission, by the way. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right, don't get carried away. We will in a minute. We'll get there. All right? So he first says, consecrate yourselves. Secondly, he says, for we did not inquire of him how to do it in the prescribed way, verse 13. Verse 14, so the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves 
in order to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. The Levites carried the ark of God with the poles on their shoulders as Moses had commanded in accordance with the word of the Lord. In accordance with the word of the Lord. David told the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brothers as singers to sing joyful songs. Everybody say joyful songs. Accompanied by musical instruments. All kinds of musical instruments. Harps, cymbals, lyres. So the Levites appointed Haman, son of Joel, from his brothers, Asaph, and from their brothers, uh, the Merahites, and Ethan. And Ethan said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Ethan. Ethan was a prescriber, son of Pastor Mike, said, Praise the Lord. And with them, their brothers. Where's your worship team brothers? Can I get an amen from the worship team brothers in the house of the Lord? And from them, their cisterns. There you go. All right. Amen. The musicians uh, were to sound the bronze cymbals. Then another group of musicians, Benaiah included in them, were to play the lyres, which would be like a uh, mandolin. We need a mandolin. Somebody say mandolin. Got a mandolin? That's you, Elliot? You don't have one. All right. Elliot's going to play the mandolin. And then, uh, where are we at? According to Al Alamoth, which was a musical term, a form, uh, that's sort of like acoustic set versus uh, whatever. It's just a different style of music. Th then several other guys with really difficult names, and Obed-Edom and Azaziah were to play the harps. Guys playing harps that, that fought on the battlefield. Go figure. Kenaniah, the head Levite, was in charge of the singing. That was his responsibility because he was skillful at it. Don't you love how practical the Word of God is? What I want you to do is I want you to get the worst singer out there and put him in charge. No, he said this guy was in charge of all the singing because he was good at it. Anybody grateful that people have that gift and they're good at it? Okay, let them lead. Hallelujah. Uh, Barakah and Elkanah were to be the doorkeepers for the ark. There's a place for everybody. Shebaniah, Jehoshaphat, Nathaniel, Amasiah, Zechariah, Benaiah, Eleazar, the priests, were to blow trumpets before the ark of God. We need some trumpets. Obed-Edom and Jehiah were also to be the doorkeepers for the ark. So David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of units of thousands went up to bring up the ark of the covenant from the Lord of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with rejoicing. Everybody say rejoicing. Listen, the, the psalmist said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. The, the word says, in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. That, that this whole thing for David was all about God's presence. Not about the procedure that, that God had described to Moses that only brought guilt and condemnation and was a reminder annually of the sins of the people and how they had not measured up. The, the holiest day was the day of atonement where the, the scapegoat was brought and a sacrifice was made for the sins of the people, but it was only an annual reminder that you're covered again for another year. And they'd go live the way they wanted. And then they'd come back. You're covered again for another year. And I'm telling you, there are thousands of people alive today who would claim to be a part of the church that, that, that are living, con content to live under God's covering and never enter in and pursue His presence for themselves. To, to be part of that process. But they're the very ones that would point fingers and criticize the church or have despising attitudes toward the leaders of that church that, that would rejoice before God and, or a style of worship, you know, oh, over there at the river, you know, that running and dancing and jumping and singing. They got all those guitars and lyres and harps. They play those cymbals. Isn't that what it's said to do? And it wasn't some sissy boy choir. These were warriors. And I think we have a lot of identity crisis 
in our men, in our nation and the world because we haven't realized that one of the most strategic positions in battle is in worshiping before the presence of the Lord. I also believe that the church is God's answer for the world. And that the church is the one that can address crisis as they come. The church is the one that should be speaking deeply to issues that divide us and areas that confuse us. But if we don't inquire of the Lord as David did when, we, when we're struggling or when we've had a defeat or when we've missed it, then we won't get back on track with His presence and His power and the joy of the Lord is no longer our strength. So now we're ministering out of weakness, searching for God rather than coming before God because we know where He is, because He's promised, if you have a struggle, if you have a crisis, I will meet with you right there between those wings of those angels on top of that, the ark of God in my presence and I will speak to you and I will teach you what you should do and I will command you in the way that you should go. And so when we come back to God with our hearts, with the sense of rejoicing and put the focus on His presence rather than our procedures or programs, then God is free to work in our hearts. Isaiah chapter 6 is the model that, that I believe David was pursuing in his heart. And we many times misunderstand it. In Isaiah 6 it is the account of the prophet coming before the presence of the Lord. And it was a very uncertain time in their nation as well. It says, when King Uzziah died, in the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah was a good king. King Uzziah had a heart for God. King Uzziah blessed the people. King Uzziah gave incredible permission and, and benefits for, for God's people to flourish. And they know when a good king dies, sometimes a bad king comes to the throne. So it said, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah goes into the temple and he says, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. And then he saw these same cherubim, these angelic creatures flying back and forth, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And he said, at the sound of their voices, the threshold of the doors shook. And when Isaiah realized the holiness of God, he realized his own unholiness, and he said, woe is me, I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And what happened? Then one of the angels flew to the altar of God and he took a live coal and he flew back to Isaiah and he put the coal to his lips and then the angel of God explained to him what had just happened. You've just been consecrated. I have just cleansed your lips. Now don't miss it. In the presence of God, Isaiah saw his own sinfulness. And some people react to that because we still do. But God has already made a way for us to deal with our sinfulness in His presence. And it's not by hiding it. It's by making Him our hiding place by confessing our sin, and He removes it from us. But when we, when we conceal it, th then it's attached to us, and that brings death to us, not life. And so what we have, instead of people, warriors in positions of worship, coming before the presence of the Lord on their behalf and on behalf of all of the people, many times we've got people not only missing in action, it's just easier to go find another church. It's just easier to go find somebody else that will accept me for who I am. To understand me. Because the process, it's all about me. And that makes you a bad person. But I have a good heart and I know I made a mistake. But if you... And the, the thing that's left out of the equation is who? God presence or to point a finger that church 
know what goes on at that church? You know what's supposed to go on at church? God never presented this picture of perfection for his church. If you go to the emergency room, what do you expect to find? Sick people in crisis. And just like an emergency room collects sick people, churches should collect sinners. And then we begin to work on this process of realizing in God's presence where God speaks to me and reveals my sin that I have just the opportunity that you do to take that sin and present it to Him and say, woe is me. I am undone. God, I'm unclean. But in that same presence, I find the cleansing. I find the Spirit of the Lord ministering to me exactly what I need to have it removed so that then I can cry out to the Lord and I can respond. Then God speaks. Who will go for me? And who will I send? And Isaiah said, I don't know. We'll try to find someone. We'll put an announcement in the bulletin and ask for volunteers. No, what did he say? Here I am. Send me. The Word says, in the day of your presence, your people will volunteer willfully. But not people who are condemned in God's presence, struggling to find a new system of sin management. The people who will volunteer freely and willfully in the day of God's presence are sons and daughters who realize the Father is the one who makes me whole. The Father is the one who cleanses me. The presence of God is the one that makes me acceptable. And his heart leapt and said, God, send me. Who who will I send? Who will go for me? Send me. And sometimes we've been disappointed that we think we're ready to be sent, but we haven't been cleansed. Because we haven't seen Him as He really is. And so here, David's heart and his passion is to exemplify that model of worship that is totally focused on the presence of God. So he said it has to start with this new sense of consecration, not only of the priest, but of the people being set apart to God for His purposes. And then it's all about the Lord's instruction. Because we didn't inquire of the Lord. Listen, I'm praying for a new passion in people's hearts for the Word of God. Not because God loves you more when you read your Bible. God has loved you more than you can ever imagine. He can never love you more than He's already loved you, and He will never love you less. You can't handle how much God loves you. But but you can't handle what you don't know. And so we read it as a love letter. We read it as instruction. We read it as an invitation. We read it as a focus of His presence being more than enough. And we find these wonderful nuggets. And then we find these incredible truths. And God makes them real to us in His presence by His Spirit, just like He did Isaiah. And in His presence is where He speaks to us. And He speaks to us through His Word. But He confirms it in His presence. And we go, I get it. I get it. I get it. So we respond with hearts wide open rather than trying to find another place to hide. It's about consecration. Everybody say consecration. It's about the Lord's instruction. Everybody say the word. It's about anointing. The the priests that were to prepare themselves had this elaborate process that God prescribed for Moses and and in leading and carrying this ark. And, And David kind of abbreviated that, but the one thing he didn't leave out was this sense of anointing. And it wasn't just the anointing of the presence being carried upon their shoulders as a picture of what Jesus would say, the Spirit of God is upon me because He has anointed me. And then he spoke about his mission, but the anointing was how he accomplished that and how he carried that out. In Exodus 29, it says, as those priests were to be consecrated or set apart, it said, take an entire bottle of precious anointing oil and pour it upon the head of Aaron. Pour it out upon him. 
many people believe that the majority of the psalms were spontaneous songs or songs that were written in this environment to be brought into the tabernacle of David in this environment of life-giving worship with stringed instruments and cymbals and drums and all of the other instruments and these choirs singing loudly and shouts of triumph and victory to God. And in those songs, you, you find prayers and you find petition and you find repentance and you find warfare and you find all of those aspects that are to go on and, and are to be a part of a life-giving church and all of the things that we encounter in our life because God's presence is more than enough for anything we will ever face. Come on, somebody. And so when we read those words, one of them is Psalm 133, where it talks about that very thing. That when brothers come together and dwell in unity, it's like an oil being poured out upon the head of the priest, running down from his head even to his beard and dripping off of his beard onto his garments, even onto the very hem of his garment. And prophetically looking forward to the New Testament where one woman in a desperate situation made it her focus to be in the presence of God, but, but she didn't dare come up to him in front. And so she came up behind him and just touched the what? Him of the garment of the great high priest, Jesus, the Nazarene. And immediately she was cleansed. Everything that went on in David's tabernacle in this tent was, was prophetically infused. Speaking of a time in the New Testament where we would be, and then I think that's why James then connected all the way back to Amos that connected to the tabernacle of David that would propel us forward even to the preparation of the wedding supper of the Lamb. That God wants us to be, once again, a prophetic people. Not being controlled by a culture or an environment, but prophetically speaking into the culture, into the environment. Words of life, words of healing, being people of peace that are filled with God's presence. Not just picketing and petitioning for our opinions, but saying, thus saith the Lord. And crying out and declaring God's word and releasing it from our hearts. Psalm 22 is basically a play-by-play -play, uh, picture of the crucifixion. It contains the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? All of my bones are out of joint. My tongue clings to the roof of my mouth. But yet, I bring salvation to your people. That wasn't David. David. That wasn't on a battlefield. That wasn't Benaiah. That wasn't a, a warrior. That was a spirit of God's presence, a spirit of praise rising up, prophetically releasing generations before what would happen that day on that cross at the place of the skull. And what we've taken instead of God's prophetic word and His presence is we've replaced it with the skull. And we worship intelligence. And we worship our own opinions. And we worship our own thought processes. And it never produces life. What produces life is joy in the presence of the Lord. What produces life is praise and thanksgiving. What produces life is letting our requests be made known to God with thanksgiving. And then letting His peace that passes our understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And David knew it, David saw it, David got it in his heart somehow because he was a man after God's own heart. How interesting that God would give the original plan to Moses, the friend of God. And he would say, all of these regulations and requirements are suspended because it's not your position, it's because you're my friend. And that they would come and meet with God, but Moses would speak to him face to face. Watch this. So Moses could come when God would usher him. He could come straight through the curtain into God's presence and God would speak to him. But that old system still wasn't enough. 
Because in Exodus 33, Moses, the one who could meet with God, the friend of God, the one who spoke to him face to face said, I need more. And God said, what do you want? And he said, show me your glory. I have to be in your presence. I have to see your presence. I have to have it confirmed in my life. Uh, He wasn't just asking for another sign. He just wanted God. And he said, Lord, you've said, lead these people. But but if you don't go with us, how are we going to make it? And so here we are living in a time where where, where we can give you 500 principles of how to grow a church of 5,000. But we got people struggling with, with, with this understanding of God's heart for a remnant that would seek Him and His presence. That He would set us apart of people for His very own. And people saying, how's this going to work? How's that going to work? How are we going to do this? How are we going to fulfill all of these things? Because God says, listen, when it comes down to your heart and you have a heart for my presence and you understand that Jesus called him together and he said, I no longer call you my servants, you are my friends. That you have access to the presence of God because of intimate relationship and friendship. And it's not that we can just suspend all of the formulas because there is a prescribed way but it's the way of the heart, not the way of the outward, not not, not our actions, not those things. It's that we bring our hearts to God, that that the true worshipers that the Father seeks, John chapter 4, what are they? Those who worship in what? Spirit and in, if you just look at your own life, you're probably stronger in one category than the other. And what we tend to do is divide. He didn't say spirit or truth. He said spirit and truth. And so many times what we've got are people who see the church as spirit or truth. I'll tell you what, we preach the word of God. We do this, we do this, we do this. We don't do that, we don't do that. We don't do that and we do not speak in tongues. That's that church. said spirit and truth and the same truth that we base our doctrine on is the same truth that says don't despise prophecy and don't forbid speaking in tongues say well what about the excesses I, I think we're a long way from excess in God's economy My heart is when we make the focus His presence, God can deal with the excesses. So He said, consecrate yourselves. Let's go back to the Word of God and find the pattern. That it's all about an anointing and us carrying that God's presence in our lives. Then it was about worship. That, that David taught people a radical new form and way of worship as they would come and they they had groups and teams and hundreds of people who would be uh, the first choir and second choir and uh, instrumentalists and all of that. This whole aspect of worship focused on God's presence with joy, with rejoicing, happy songs. And sometimes we have put the focus on Happiness as an emotion and an emotional response at the substitute of God's genuine presence in our lives. David wasn't about that. David knew there was a lot more victory to be had in celebrating before the battle than there was to bring him mournful songs after the battle. Not, not waiting on the outcome of the battle to determine the, the, the tempo of the song, but realizing that God is our victory, that God is our strength, and that in Him we're overcomers, and, and that in Him we cannot lose. David also composed songs of repentance that, that dealt with the depths of his own sin and other people's sin 
and, and he talked about that, the nasty, ugly process of sin management when I tried to conceal my sin and when I hid it, my bones wasted away. I was in agony. I, 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 was, I was desperate before you. He, he just talks about I fainted like I was having a heat stroke. It's one of these songs that they would lift up before God, but it ends with victory. But God, when I bring my heart to You and I bring my sin to You, with You there is forgiveness. So therefore, You are feared. Come on, somebody. Can you see the distinction? It's not just coming and saying, well, you know, we come and we sing the happy songs first and then we sing a couple worship songs and, you know, then we bring the Word and then it, 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 it's just, we could just get in another process, program, formula, whatever. It's about doing that with our heart before God and realizing you're part of the team. That, that we find ourselves in a place where God gives a skill and an anointing in our life and a gift in our life and when we come back and we use it for Him, it becomes a powerful expression back to Him of our recognition of what His presence can do in our lives. Then it's not just about uh, worship it's also about celebration and rejoicing and blessing. Then the last thing I want you to see, it's about prayer. That, that in chapter 16, 1 Chronicles 16, verse uh, 4. Let's read from verse 1. They brought the ark of God and they set it inside the tent. Now they've completed this process. Set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it and they presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Burnt offerings cover our sin. Burnt offerings are, are sin offerings being brought to God. The sacrifice. But they not only presented offerings for their sin to bring them into this place, they presented fellowship offerings to, to bring them into this place of God's presence. Right? And then as they presented these offerings, they presented them before God after David had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord, and then he gave a loaf of bread and a cake of dates and a cake of raisins to each Israelite man and woman. And then he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to make petition, to give thanks, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph, the chief, Zechariah second, and then he lists in order those that were to do that. They were to play the instruments. Asaph was to sound the cymbals. Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests, were to blow the trumpets regularly before the covenant of God. And then David committed to them this song on that day. I believe it was just a spontaneous song that they all began to respond to the Lord and sing and worship Him. The point being, one of the names for the place of God, the house of God, is Bethel, which means house of bread. So how interesting that David would make this temporary place for God's presence, and, and as the people came into God's presence, David would give them bread. They would bring offerings, but, but they would be blessed with bread. Malachi said, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And so here's this process of coming not only to give but to receive. They didn't come for that. It's that whole expression of generosity that David gives to them. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. That when we come to Him and eat in His presence, that it's a powerful transformation in our lives and he appointed people specifically to petition the Lord it's a form of prayer not, not to get people to sign a petition but to come together in agreement to bring needs before God what a powerful thing to know that when you're in a position of need that you're surrounded by powerful men who are warriors in the natural and in the spirit who have been appointed to pray and intercede for you. How many of you have ever found yourself in a battle and you're just grateful to have some brothers know how to fight alongside you? 
All right? And so that, that we don't fight alone and, and we're not called to do that, that there's a specific role and a place for that. And I want you to see that it's mixed together. That it's not just we're going to have a prayer meeting. That, that prayer and praise and worship and intercession and, and rejoicing in God and, and then going into this place of battle are, are all brought together in God's presence. Because they all involve Him. And if they don't, then we're fighting in our own strength. And God hadn't called us to do that. God's called the joy of the Lord to be our strength. God's called His presence to be the place where our joy is made full and complete. That the power of His presence would enter at times so dramatically that even those who were assigned and appointed to those positions couldn't even stand up. Not every time, but there are those times. And so when we understand how God wants to use our lives and the, the process to get there, He didn't make it difficult. It's the same things that James said in, in Acts chapter 15. We should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. I want you to know, God has never made it difficult for His people to get to Him. That's why when he gave the, the, the dimensions and the design for the Ark of Covenant, and he said, that's where I will be, that's where I will meet with you, that's a place of my presence. And he said, the handles are never to be removed. The poles are never to be taken out. That, that there's always a place that we can grasp on, that, that a place that we can come to God and realize everything I need is in Him. Everything that can fix my heart is in Him. That we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Listen, people are not your problem. But they always will be until you become people of His presence. And until we bring our hearts before God and realize like Isaiah, I am a man of unclean lips. Only then can we say, and let me tell you about them, they have unclean lips too. Isaiah didn't run into the presence of the Lord to tattletale in his immaturity. That in the presence of a holy God is not the time to share your complaint about how rude other people are. About how much they need God about if they just turn to you, Lord. That's not prayer. That's certainly not prophecy. That's just pathetic. That's us hiding our heart. And God is longing to heal what we're so afraid to reveal. I saw the Lord. I saw how awesome that He was. Isaiah said, just, just as coattails filled the entire temple. The power, the sound of his voice, how awesome that he was, and then he realized how awesome he wasn't. And he didn't start with somebody else, started with himself. God, this is going to kill me here. This is going to ruin me. You're holy, I am not. You are clean, I am unclean. Thank God he looked at his disciples and said, you are already clean because of the word. I have spoken to you, John 15. Anybody grateful? That when we come to God's presence, it's not with this apprehension, but it is with truth, and it is with the Spirit. It is responding to that, and it is listening to God, and then being able to respond to Him and what He says, and saying, God, I want to be used by you. Here I am. God, if you want somebody, send me. Lord, you need somebody, use me. God, you want somebody? I, I, I'm here, I'm volunteering. How many volunteers do we have in the presence of the Lord this morning to say, I, I just want to be a person of His presence? How many are tired of coming to God with your problems? Because it's the same problem you came with last time. And, 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 and instead of becoming a real person of His presence, you become like a Rush, ba, a Rush Limbaugh ditto head. Ditto. 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 You know, there was a guy in the, in the Bible named Dodo. He, he was one of the mighty men's dads. Easy now. Talk about his daddy. But 
but there's no ditto. In fact, the New Testament says when we come, we're not to ditto our prayers. We're not to repeat the same stuff, repeat the same formula, make the same quotations, just recite the same thing over and over. We're to come with our hearts in spirit and in truth and let our requests be made known to God. How many are really here this morning in, in, in God's presence genuinely it's not near as much about you as it is a burden that God's placed on your heart for somebody else of what they're walking through. Somebody shared with me some things this morning. Melanie Phillips' mom is in the final stages of battling cancer and is really in a difficult place with pain management. In fact, it's unmanageable. And so what a blessing to have somebody just come and say, and God put a word that says, listen, let's just petition God. Let's just bring it before the Lord. Let's just stand together and pray. The word tells us to speak up for those that even can't speak for themselves. How many would just like to be a voice? We use it for all kinds of other things. How many would like to use it in God's presence? Just have God drop something on your heart and say, is that a real ministry? Well, it was for David. There's a whole group of guys. All they did was bring petition. Where's the prayer team? Let them come but they ministered before the presence of God. Where's the worshipers? Let them come before the presence of God. That they had played trumpets before the presence of God. It was before this ark. God takes the walls down and he says, now you come before my presence as you are and let's do business. Let's take this thing to a whole different level. Let's don't come wallowing in our guilt and condemnation. Let, let's let the freedom and liberty that God brings in our life set us free Instead of those who are managing their sin, those who are ministering as sons. Come on, somebody. Just to come before God and say, Father, that's what we want. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning? Not out of formula, but out of reverence. Out of honor to the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10 gives us this beautiful model in the New Testament that's full of the life of God. Of Jesus being the sacrifice. Jesus making the way. It says that we don't just continually offer the blood of bulls and goats like they did in the Old Testament in the tabernacle because it could never cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. It was only a reminder of their sin. That's what guilt and condemnation is. Just a reminder that you're not there yet, that you haven't arrived, that you're still struggling. But Jesus made a new and living way. Jesus brought cleansing. Jesus brought forgiveness. Not only that, it says Jesus was the one who made perfect forever those who would come before him to worship. And when we acknowledge that sacrifice, the cross is never closed. It's an open door because Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And I bring you before the Father, His very presence. And my spirit works in you to cry out, Abba, Father, to Him. As a son who's been forgiven and freed to minister, not as one who has to an find another way to manage your sin issues in his life. If you need to find that freedom this morning, or you're one of those that I described, that, that your heart is just leaping, and here in the day of His presence, you just want to freely volunteer, and you just want to say, God, I, I need a change. I want to do it your way. I need the transformation that it brought in David's life and in kingdoms that followed who would bring people back to this model of worship, to the life that God had prescribed, to the presence of God in this Ark of the Covenant that they would bring before Him and put the focus on God's presence even in the heart of people who had left Him. You'd say, Pastor, that's me. I hear the message. That's my heart cry. I want you to lift your hand all over this sanctuary this morning and say, that's me. Not only calling out to the Lord, maybe you need to know Him this morning, but coming back to the Lord, coming back to a place of His presence saying, I want that to be the foremost thing in my life. God's presence in me. That, that I want to hear God say what He needs. I want to be the one to respond to Him. Come on, all over the building, raise your hands and then we'll pray together. 
you have a hand raised, just go ahead and stand to your feet. There's a couple of things I want us to do before we leave this morning. So if you would, those that would stand, God, use me. Here I am. I want to be a person of your presence. Thank you, Lord. And would somebody just move around these or some way up here at the top? I just want us to pray one for another this morning. So those are moving in those directions. I want those of you that are in a place that uh, you have a prayer need in your life. I know, is Kari still in here, Brad? Is she here? She's out here? So I want you to come. You're going to go get her? All right, we want to pray for you. If you have a need this morning for healing, or Bill, I want you to come stand here this morning if you would. And uh, let's just stand in the gap for others this morning who need that. Uh, Tina Walters is walking through some uh, complications and process with her uh, eye surgery. So she needs healing. Uh, would you just stand in for her this morning, Charlotte, down here? If there's a need in your life this morning and you need healing uh, or you need God to touch you, you need the power of his presence in your life in a specific way, I want you just to respond. Come stand with these. Or if you just want to be part of the prayer team, you want to, you want to be on the petition team this morning. Come on, you're drafted because it's God's presence and what he's calling us to do. Amen? Is that clear, everybody? Basically, let's just move right now. Just like they commingled. Uh, worship and prayer and intercession and praise. That's just what we're doing right now. We're just simply responding uh, and uh, to what God's calling us to do. So those of you that are connected, come on, Grandma. Those of you that are connected there with somebody this morning as you're praying, just connect right here. Just connect at the altar where two or three agree together. Come on, let's just lift our voices to the Lord for a moment, could we? Father, we're agreeing with what you said. We're agreeing with the word that you spoke, which does not fail and cannot return void because you said it would not. And Lord, we thank you that that word brings life. That word is our salvation. That word brings light. It bring, it's a lamp to our pathway. You said you would teach us and instruct us in the way that we should go as we came into your presence. Father, this morning, I believe that you spoke this word in our hearts so we can unite, so that we can agree, so that we can come together in that place of unity where your anointing flows more easily, more powerfully. Father, we put ourselves in alignment under that word. I pray that you would just, Lord, graciously deal with every question in our heart and certainly every despising attitude so that we just come to a place, Lord God, of freedom where we release things that are bondages in our life and we embrace to whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So Lord, we look to you. We look to the power of your presence. Lord, we thank you that your word brought healing because you bore the sickness on the cross and you released to us the freedom that you offered to us your body to bring healing into ours. That Father, as your body was broken, ours could be whole. So once again, we come, Lord, not just to a physical table and receive, but to your presence where we receive of the spirit that's based in the truth of what you've spoken in your word and over our lives. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the life that is being ministered even now where, where places of death have ruled. We thank you for the song of victory and, and the song of triumph that you are replacing Father, with the feelings and the emotions of disappointment that can just sidetrack our lives, sometimes for years. Father, I pray that according to your word, you would put a new song in our mouths, even a hymn of praise unto our God. That, Father, we would realize that it's not us earning a place of righteousness, that we're made righteous, and that the song of the righteous is a song of joy, a song of victory, a song th that is very familiar because it's a family song sung by sons and daughters. Father, I'm grateful this morning that you've called us to life and to life more abundantly. And I'm grateful, Lord, for the strength that there is in that. Lord, I pray for the prophetic words that are even the foundation and the basis for the name of this church. The storehouse that you spoke to 
Brother Matheny years ago. Father, now the river of life that you've called us to be. I pray, Lord God, that we would see the fulfillment of that prophetic word that where the river flows, everything lives. That we would be people, Lord God, not just trying to find a way into your presence, but where your presence is flowing out from that place, bringing a river of life with its superabundance. Every month, not every season, the trees bear fruit and the trees are a harvest of righteousness. Lord, that where the river flows, everything lives and that there's healing in that stream, that it, that it teems with living creatures. Father, I pray that we would see not only the abundance of that life, but the bringing it back to the presence of God. Jesus, we give you praise and glory this morning for who you are and all that you're doing and will continue to do through us. In Jesus' name. Would everyone stand together, please? As we finish this morning. I, I don't have a, a loaf of bread or a cake of raisins or dates or anything for you. Uh, I know some of you single folks are disappointed that, that I don't have dates, but I, I'm going to date my wife, but, but what I do have, I give to you. And there are times as pastor where you bake the bread and there's the other time where you cook the steaks. And, and I believe it's time that we partake of the meat as well as the bread. The other thing I want to just share with you is that I feel like our, the direction in the next few weeks is for us to come together and, and establish um, on the basis of His Word uh, a, a stronger outreach and a stronger flow. So you'll be hearing some stuff about small groups and uh, we're going to study uh, first Philemon and then James and let that be a foundation for many of our small groups and so I want many of you as David appointed them uh, many of you are going to be approached you say well I don't have time I don't want to do this or host a small group or whatever we're, we're going to make it as easy as possible for you but, but we're also going to be very strategic in uh, what those groups are about and what they're for especially for this next season amen and so I want you to be a part of that and want you to, to realize how much we appreciate you, how much we appreciate the, the generosity and who you are, and uh, that as we walk through some of the, the battles and the challenges, uh, shared a story, I think it was on Wednesday night, of a guy that used to be in position of leadership and came to my office and walked through a battle and didn't do it real well. And kind of one of those David experiences, it wasn't physical death, but... Uh, it was a very difficult thing spiritually. And basically he just said, I'm done. I'm not going to do that anymore. I, I don't see how you do what you do. That, that, that was a small role, but man, the warfare that I walked through for that. And I don't say that to put the emphasis on me, but all of us have gone through battles. Your battles aren't my battles. I didn't know what I was signing up for. God drafted me. All right? But, but you too. And if we could choose our battles and choose our situations and whatever, most of us would never have the rich lives that we have because we'd just like it easier. God doesn't have an easy button. God has His presence. And He doesn't just tell us what to do. He promises to walk with us through it. And more than anything else, I hope that's what you hear. I hope that's what you see. I hope that you can navigate through that, the intensity or whatever, volume, my style. And that the heart of it is God is calling us to be people of His presence. People of His presence. And I make no apologies for that whatsoever that I want this church to be a place of God's presence. I want it to be a place of God's power. And, and when we are people of His presence, we have the power. That's what the ark was all about. 
And so with that, when we come together in unity, it's an awesome thing. So for that, I'm grateful. It said, David brought the people together after they worshiped the Lord in all of these ways, some 16 ministries. Then he blessed the people and then he went home to bless his family. So I just want to speak a word of blessing over you as I do often at the end of a service. But then I want you to go home and I want you to bless your family. I want you to bless your household. I want you to step into a place of leadership. The son or daughter he's called you to be and be that. Be that with passion. Pursue it. Move past the disappointments and the pettiness and the junk that the enemy would just easily offer as substitutes. And make it your intention. I'm going to press in to the presence of God. You may want to start by just gathering your family or if you're a single person, the same thing. He sets the solitary in families. He calls us together as one. And read David's psalm, the song that he gave them to sing in God's presence that day. The last part there of chapter 16, 1 Chronicles chapter 16. Let's make that our focus. And when we come together, let's come together with that intention. And let's live lives that focus on that and reflect it. It's God's process of transformation beginning to end. What he started, what what he reinstituted with David, what what he reestablished in the New Testament, what he has for us as New Testament believers being kingdoms and a, a, a kingdom of priests unto our God. Amen. Father, I pray that you'd bless your people this morning. We would take the bread and the meat that we have received. That not only would we process it, digest it. We would set it apart, sanctify it, consecrate it by the word of God and prayer all over again. Not being hearers of the word, but doing what it says. Stepping into the place where you want to change us and transform us. Not because you don't like the way you made us. You made us perfect. But that sin mars the imperfection. And many times the clay says to the potter, why have you made me like this? Lord, I pray that you'd make us vessels of your honor because we are carriers of your presence. Priests, sons and daughters who minister to the Lord our God with passion consistency holiness and volunteer freely in the day of your presence in Jesus mighty name